Hello there, I'm Rob Jennings from the Dyscalculia Network, and I'm delighted to welcome Professor Brian Butterworth today and to be able to ask him a few questions about his new book, Can Fish Count? And What Animals Reveal About a Uniquely Mathematical Mind. Brian, congratulations on your new book. Thank you. I'd like to ask you a few questions, if I may. Um, first one would be, can you tell us a little bit about where the idea for the book came from? <laughs> and well, there's the long answer or the short answer. Uh, <laughs> the, um, let me try and be fairly brief about this. Uh, I've been working on developmental dyscalculia for many years now and also acquired dyscalculia. And it seemed to me that uh, our numerical abilities are rather specialized. They occupy a special part of the brain and they can be impaired or spared, even though other cognitive functions um, are working or not working, as the case may be. In that sense, it's a bit like color blindness. Uh, so everybody, apart from a very few people, uh, can see the world in color. Um, but some people, through an accident of genetics, can't, uh, or have anomalous color vision. And I think the same is true for numbers. Most of us see the world in numerical terms, and uh, apart from a few who can't. Uh, and uh, one of the questions is, is it a, a heritable condition, like color blindness, or is it due to some other uh, cognitive function? And so to answer the, the inheritance question, uh, you have to uh, look to see whether other creatures um, have something which is rather similar to our ability to what I call extract numerical information from the environment. Yeah. And so uh, that's why I started to, to look at the numerical abilities of other creatures. Now, um, one of the reasons I focused on fish is one of those happy accidents of science. Um, there's a very brilliant student from the University of Padua in Italy, um, who I knew slightly, who wanted to come and do some work on the numerical abilities of adults in my lab. Uh, his speciality was the numerical ability of fish. So when he came to uh, work in my lab, we asked him to give a, you know, a presentation about the stuff he'd been doing. And I thought it was, it was really fascinating. Mm. And um, then I actually conceived a new question, which I would ask him. I would say, we've done this with humans. Have you thought about doing it with fish? And so <laughs> there's a series of experiments now published where we started with human, uh, human study and uh, my, the student, Christian Agrillo, um, tried it out with fish and we had some interesting results as, uh, as a result. So that's why I got interested in fish as, as a, a kind of model uh, creature for looking at uh, the, if you like, the evolution of our numerical abilities. Okay, thank you. And that's fascinating. In, in the book, you, you discuss not only fish, but mammals, birds rep and reptiles. Mm -hmm. um, which of these was your personal favourite? And uh... <laughs> oh, you mean besides fish? Besides well, I've, fish. I've only ever worked with fish, and then only at a distance. I don't, how should I say, get my hands wet in this okay. particular study. Um, uh, my colleagues get their hands wet uh, in the fish studies. Um, but um, the, the only ones I, I really have experienced personally um, uh, are chimpanzees. And uh, there's a, a wonderful setup in um, at the Kyoto Primate Research Institute in Inuyama in Japan, uh, where they have a lot of uh, chimpanzees and where they've done a lot of foundational work on chimpanzee abilities, which are in some respects even better than our own. In other respects, not so good as our own as, as you would imagine. But there are things that uh, these chimps can do that they do better than we do. 
uh, for example. Uh, if you train them to match uh, a random array of dots with a digit, so let's say seven dots with the digit seven, they can learn to do this. And quite a lot of the, the chimps in this particular uh, research institute have learned to do this. And some of them uh, do it better than we do. That is, they can do, um, they do it quicker, they do it more accurately, particularly when you get to higher numbers. And the other thing that they can do much better than at least Japanese graduate students, I haven't exposed myself to this particular task, is um, they will see a sequence of digits randomly arrayed on a screen for a very brief interval, let's say a couple of hundred milliseconds, then the, um, the, the digits will be replaced by uh, a square of just a blank square. Then they have to touch these blank squares in the numerical order of the digits that were in that, wow. their, those positions um, to begin with. And um, there are a couple of chimp, there's one chimpanzee called chimpanzee I, AI, uh, who does it about as well as um, a human. And her son, Ayumu, uh, does it much better than humans. Um, so there are some things that, that, that chimpanzees can do better. And the other thing about chimpanzees is they've got a brain which is similar to ours. They've got their genes are 98.8% the same as ours. And so they are quite a good model for at least the heritability of this capacity from you know the common ancestors of chimpan modern chimpanzees and modern humans six million years ago and in fact you can go back a bit further uh, these to monkeys and um i haven't worked on monkeys myself um though i did have some plans to do it um so monkey the common ancestor of monkeys and humans was about 30 million years ago and the brains, although much smaller than ours, are rather similar in structure. Mm. And you find uh, a kind of homologous or equivalent area in monkey brain. You, have, you can't really do it with chimps, but you can do it with monkeys. So monkey brains have, uh, as I say, a, an equivalent area of their cortex for numerical processing to the area that, that we have in our brains. I mean, the, in the parietal mode, which is sort of round right about there. Yeah bilaterally. Um, so I think that, that the, our particular mechanism for extracting numerical information out of from the environment goes back at least to the common ancestor of humans and monkeys 30 million years ago. Right. When you get farther back, it's more difficult because certainly creatures that aren't mammals don't have a cortex. This is the thing that's unique to mammals, a cortex. So birds can be pretty good and they don't have a cortex. Um, uh, fish could be pretty good and they don't have a cortex. And one of the things I discovered in my homework for this book was that insects and spiders can also be quite good at counting. And they certainly don't have a cortex and they have very tiny brains. So a bee, for example, has about a million neurons in its tiny head. We have 86 or so billion neurons. Um, and yet they can actually do some quite good things. They can, they can count up to three or four. They can do addition and subtraction. They can have a sense of zero. Um, I guess their navigation skills are sort of amazing as well in terms of getting back to the hive. Yeah, that, well, that has to be, that's right. And we, we've known since the work of von Frisch before the Second World War, that not only can they find their way back to the hive, they can actually tell their hive mates uh, where to find the food. And this is, you know, von Frisch got a Nobel Prize for this and, and well-deserved. And you could say that, um, uh, bees with their tiny brains are the only other creatures in the world that we know about that use a symbolic um, way of communicating uh, numerical information, which is the so-called waggle dance. Well, it's not so-called. It is a waggle dance. They waggle. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. 
It's incredible, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So um, in, in your book, you include an excellent summary on the importance of numeracy for a numerate society. Mm. I realise this is a bit of a huge question, <laughs> but what do you think can be done to help those children and adults with either low numeracy or indeed dyscalculia? Well, I think there are two issues here. One is low numeracy and the other is dyscalculia. So dyscalculia, I think, is um, an inefficient mechanism that's I, uh, that's should have been inherited. Um, now, it isn't necessarily inherited uh, badly. Uh, I think in many cases it is, but not in all. Um, so anything that interferes with the development of the parietal lobe uh, can lead to dyscalculia. So, for example, um, um, prematurity, particularly extreme prematurity. So, if the infant is born uh, fewer than 26 uh, weeks of gestation, uh, then uh, dyscalculia is, uh, is certainly going to be much more likely. Um, fetal alcohol syndrome can lead to serious numerical disabilities. Whether it's really dyscalculia is controversial, but it wouldn't surprise me if it is. So it's congenital in, I think, in all cases, but not always inherited, not always genetic. Um, and we also know that in general, um, numerical abilities do have um, variance. Let me be a bit more technical about this. Variation in numerical abilities is at least 30% heritable. That is, this is data from uh, large-scale twin studies uh, by uh, scientists like Yulia Kovas and Goldsmiths. Um, so uh, to help dyscalculics, particularly, you have to understand that their mechanism for extracting numerical information from the environment, which is very easy to assess, uh, for example, you could just ask individuals to say as quickly as they can how many dots there are on a dis in a display. Yeah. And we know from our own studies and other people's studies that if you're not very good at this, uh, you're not going to be very good at learning arithmetic in school. Yeah. Um, so you have to have an intervention which helps kids understand uh, uh, about the numerosity of sets, that is how many objects there are in a set, yeah. operations on set, what, ha what happens when you combine sets or when you uh, segregate sets into subsets um, and so on, and then link that understanding with what we have to learn in school or at home uh, in terms of the symbol, uh, the symbol systems that we use for numbers like the digits and our counting words and the operations that we have to learn on these digits or counting words like five times three is what? Um, so we have to understand that. We have to relate that to something in, in terms of sets. Yeah. And so this is how you would help these people. Now, just being bad at maths, there can be all sorts of reasons for that. Yeah. I mean, we did a, a very large scale prevalence study some years ago in, um, in Havana, Cuba. And what we found was that this test of dot enumeration, how many dots are there in this display as quickly as you can, um, picked out um, about 27% of the kids who were not very good at arithmetic. Right. That means it's, uh, there are lots of other reasons. For, I mean, the other 73% have other reasons for not being very good at arithmetic. Uh, my own particular excuse is I didn't get on well with my maths teacher. Um, but there are lots of other reasons. Like, for example, you don't have a maths teacher. You, you grow up in a, in a part of the world where they don't have maths teachers or not very good maths teachers yeah. or not well-trained maths teachers. Also, kids who go to school hungry, um, we know that this actually interferes with their learning, all sorts of things, but yeah. maths will be included. And so... Um, the present government's treatment of children is um, 
is going to lead to lots of kids who are really bad at maths because they go to school hungry. Mm. So um, that's another reason why. why um, so feed kids properly would be my advice here. That's not the only thing. Feed them properly, train the teachers properly, pay the teachers properly, don't stress the teachers too much. And if you follow the, the countries where um, mass education is most effective, like Finland or Singapore, where I've also worked, um, you need to give the, 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 the teachers plenty of training um, and also updating their training every year so that they know what the best methods are. So there are a lot of things to do to help help improve numeracy in society. Brilliant. Okay, and possibly the last question would be what's in the pipeline? What other projects do you have next? Um, well, I've actually got, I've got two, two, um, two projects uh, which I'm particularly interested in. One is in a very, very early stage, which is um, we want to explore uh, the human brain in more detail. And this means um, actually taking the naked brain, you have to take off part of the skull, wow. then you stimulate parts of the brain to see uh, how this affects uh, numerical processing. This is in a very early stage. So, for example, if, if, um, uh, if a patient has, um, let's say, a, a cancer of glioma, that requires surgery, you have to cut it out, then you have to take off the skull. And that gives us the opportunity to, uh, to do some experiments with uh, probing uh, individual neurons in, in the brain. This, I say, is an early stage. I don't know whether we're going to be able to do it quite the way I want. The other one is with fish. So as I said, one of the issues here is um, genetics. And um, we don't know what genes are involved in numerical abilities. Um, there have been some large genome wine association studies um, which have not been replicated. So we don't know much about um, the genetic basis of our abilities. But we've got some candidate genes. And um, one way in which you can see whether these candidate genes really do affect a new American abilities is to take a, um, a, a an animal model which has these genes, uh, for example, the zebrafish. Um, you modify the genetic makeup of the zebrafish, and the genome has been sequenced. So we we know what the genome is like. We know how to modify it uh, to see whether this affects our numerical abilities. Uh, you know, if we if we take this gene out, does it make them worse? Does it make them better? So we can take candidate genes from human studies and test them in our zebrafish. And uh, so this is where we're making some progress on this. So invite me back next year and I'll tell you whether we found anything of interest. Um, I'd lo so, love that. Sounds fascinating. Thank you very much indeed, Brian. Not at all. Thank Bye. you very much for asking me, Rob. No Bye for now. Bye.